I would say that you know no organism perceives the whole world uh, in its total reality uh, as it is. I would say you know each animal experiences the world through the window of its own visual and perceptual capacities, right, and its limitations. You don't need to be necessarily slavishly biomimetic. Our, our idea was to basically test to see whether the principles we extract from honeybee vision, flight and navigation and guidance, for example, do they really, can you use optic flow information to do all the things that insects do? You know, for a long time, bees and other insects were really considered to be rather simple, reflexive automatons. Pattern recognition in bees has gone a lot beyond this uh, over the last uh, few dec decades, so they're, they're able to learn abstract properties of patterns. This is Brain Inspired. Hello, good people. I'm Paul. So it's often stated that the human brain is the most complex object in the universe. That's probably not true, but we do know it is complex, and our efforts to understand how our brains work and or to build human-like intelligence it's constantly running up against that complexity. And of course, we study the brains of other organisms as models or a proxy of our own brains, hoping we can extract general principles, often from brains much smaller than our own. For example, the bee has a brain with about 1 million neurons. That's a big number, but it's also tiny compared to our 86 billion neurons. But organisms like bees with relatively few neurons keep surprising us with impressive feats of intelligent behavior. Today, my guest is Manjam Srinivasan, or Srini, who is an emeritus professor at the Queensland Brain Institute in Australia. So you know about the bee waggle dance, I'm sure, where a bee will fly to a location and forage in that location and then fly back to the hive and do a little dance to communicate to the rest of the hive where the good food is. Srini has for a long time studied the abilities of bees and other insects and birds, and in this episode, he shares much of what he has discovered, specifically about bees and how they navigate, and how they use perception to control their flight speed and path, and their graceful landings, for example. We also discuss a few of Srini's robotics projects, where he applied principles of bee flight uh, to create fully automated aerial robots that can take off and fly and maneuver and land quite well. And beyond flight, we also discuss some of the higher cognitive abilities bees can be trained to perform, the possibility of their having subjective experience, and their capacity to feel pain. In the show notes, I'll link to a nice review that summarizes a lot of what we talk about in this episode. Show notes are at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 134. Thank you to my Patreon supporters. Here's a little something extra for you today, which I hope captures my gratitude for your support. And bonus points if you can reference this little ditty. Thank you for being a friend. Travel down a road and back again. Thank you, guys. Okay, enjoy Srini. When I got into neuroscience, like like many people, I uh, <laughs> I, I was interested in the, the quote unquote big questions like consciousness, and I ended up studying um, monkeys in a laboratory setting. Why uh, why insects? And I don't mean that as an insult. Uh, what what drew you into studying uh, bees and insects and birds? Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you for having me. First of all, it's oh. a great, uh, great, great delight and a great honor to be with you on the oh, show. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So, just a little bit about my background. Uh, I was I was born and raised in India. Uh, I did my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and my master's degree in control systems uh, in Bangalore. Uh, and towards the end of my master's degree, I think I underwent a kind of a premature midlife crisis. Uh, I wanted to pursue something other than just a straight standard career as an electrical engineer. Uh, so one of my professors suggested that I could try to maybe apply my knowledge in doubly electrical engineering and control systems to modeling the function of a uh, functioning of a biological system. So we decided to model a system that controls the movement of the human eye uh -huh. uh, when it tracks a moving target. Uh, modeling it as a servo mechanism, you know, feedback control servo, me servo mechanism. Smooth pursuit, the smooth pursuit. I've smooth this. pursuit yeah. and saccadic movement, yes, okay. that's right. Uh, yeah, and this turned out to be a very engage engaging sort of project, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and so when I went to Yale to pursue a PhD in engineering, 
I was again keen to do research that was sort of at the interface between engineering and biology. Uh, and the only person I could find there at that time who had similar interests was a professor by the name of Gary Bernard and who was studying uh, and modeling the optics of insect eyes. Uh, this sounded quite interesting and I jumped right into it. Um, in those days, you didn't worry about future career prospects. You just followed your heart, you know, and then let things happen. <laughs> it was just wonderful. Maybe things are not the same these days, unfortunately. <laughs> How is it different these days? <laughs> oh, my my students, for example, are constantly worried about, you know, what, whether this project is going to get them, get them a job, going to give them a, allow them to continue in academia, right. you know, sort of that sort of thing. What's in it for me? Uh, they're not so interested in what the intrinsic questions that are being asked and how interesting they are. That seems to be secondary. So you went kind of um, naturally went from control systems and engineering into studying what what has you know classically been studied from kind of an engineering perspective because the the psychotic eye, eye movement system and the smooth pursuit eye movement system are both very well understood circuits. So that was probably a yeah, and then that was probably a smooth transition to to the optic uh, studies in insects, huh? Exactly, exactly. And it, it, it seemed, uh, it, the interesting thing uh, with the PhD was that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gary himself was uh, really more into the optics and the photoreceptor aspects of it, whereas I was more interested in, in, in sort of higher level processing that drives the behavior. So uh, it, it let me be fairly independent uh, as a PhD student. And, and, you know, so it was nice. We had almost like two separate sort of things going on in the same lab, which is really, which is really good fun. So it taught me to be a little more independent, you know, fairly early in my career, which is really good. <laughs> That's a nice balance. Do you, would you do you recommend that kind of balance? If you know, thinking about people have struggled to find the right advisor and what's the perfect match, and so mm. are you are you suggesting that it might be nice to yeah, have? Yeah, I, 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 ideally, if there's funding to allow a student to do uh, whatever they want to do for their PhD, and if the supervisor, uh, in, in this case myself, feels competent enough to you know supervise that particular project then that would probably be the best solution. Uh, unfortunately, there's so, so many different constraints because students come quite often, uh, you, you're hiring them through a, through a grant, which uh, forces you to do uh, you know, a particular kind of project. And you have to sort of keep them uh, on, on that straight and narrow project to make sure that the, the, the project succeeds, mm -hmm. right? And, and there are all these constraints, which are really, um, it's sad, because, but it's, no, it wasn't there in the old days. Uh, it was it was so uh, different. Uh, you know, you went to, to do, register or do a PhD with a professor. You had your fellowship or scholarship, and and uh, off you went. There was there were no constraints. <laughs> All you had to do is to do good work and uh, produce a lot of good publications, and that was it. Well, th those yeah. problems are behind you, right? Because you're three years retired now. <laughs> thankfully, yes, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, my my engagement is all it's all fun and no responsibility. So I'm I'm sort of a a backseat operator in some of the, a couple of grants, research grants, but I'm not getting any money. I'm deliberately not asking for any money. Uh, I just want all fun and no responsibility. Oh, so that's I'm great. kind of an armchair <laughs> advisor, yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Well, you've done a lot of work over the years um, on bee in particular navigation, and you've worked on birds as well. And we'll, you know, we may talk about birds, but mostly we'll probably talk uh, about bees and their navigation abilities and flight abilities yeah, yeah. and their so, cognition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what, um, give us a sample. What, what has your work? I mean, this is a, I know it's an impossibly um, large question because you've done so much work, but um, what, what has your work um, revealed about bee navigation and flight? Yeah, sure. I could start by telling you a little bit about how, how I got into bees uh, in the mm -hmm. first place, because at Yale, I was really working with uh, with houseflies, uh, looking at the movement detecting system of the housefly oh. and seeing how it guided, uh, you know, uh, course stabilization and how it also enabled the fly to pick up move, small moving targets like other flies uh, and chase them um, for the purpose of mating or territorial defense. So that was the project for my PhD at Yale. But then I moved on to do a postdoc at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, where I also had to lecture and <laughs> learn, learn German and lecture in German. Oh my gosh! <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that was quite a challenge. Yes. <laughs> Are you still, are you fluent? For students, uh, well, not anymore. Uh, but, you know, even even when I was fluent, I, I, I have more, it was stressful for me. It was also even more stressful for the students because <laughs> the poor student had to kind of try and understand what I was trying to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But but uh, Zurich was such a, such an amazing place. It was the department of Professor Rudy Gavena who introduced me to the world of bees. And it was there that I realized that the bee is an amazing learning machine. You know, and what I found, not only can they learn amazing things very quickly, 
But what's really appealing is that you can study their behavior by tapping into their natural lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So you can sort of entice the bee to come into your lab, you know, draw it in with a nice draw, you know, sort of reward of sugar water, move the sugar water feeder in step by step into your lab, and they're coming in of their own free will. I mean, there's no coercion here. They're free to go somewhere else if they find better food. But we have a very strong sugar solution that they find it quite tempting, and and they come and and the thing is, you you you're you're catching them, you're sort of observing them in the in the sort of a natural style of behavior, it's, and they're, so they're you're not really you're not being forced, not like a caged uh, rat or mouse that you're trying to train, right? It's it's, it's really a freely moving uh, behaving animal, yeah. and also once you have them coming into your lab and visiting your apparatus where you which you've designed to. Uh, try and answer the question you question that you set up. I mean, they fly back and forth, and you can film them in a way that actually addresses the question that you want to answer. If you're studying another creature, for example, like a fly or a dragonfly, you have to have your cameras trained on the creature all the time, and then wait until you find the right move, moment when that behavior occurs, mm-hmm. right? Whereas here, you don't have to do that. You have them directly coming to you, and they're doing exactly what you want them to do in the right location. So you've got full sort of uh, observability, observability, I would say, a very efficient way of kind of observing and recording what they're doing uh, in the lab. So uh, that, that was really uh, very nice about bees. And of course, uh, uh, no bees are hurt or harmed in the whole process. Uh, once you finish the experiments, they're free to go back and continue the normal foraging lifestyle. How long, do, how long does a bee live? I forget. They live uh, about, a, about four weeks at most. Okay. But typically, our experiments uh, run for uh, three or four days. And for three or four days, you've got the answers you want. Mm-hmm. Either you've got them or you don't have them. But <laughs> in three or four days, you let, let them go. It must take, what, takes probably, what, two days to entice them in with the sugar water and, and get them comfortable coming no, in? No, 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 no. Well, it depends. No. Uh, well, in Zurich, we had, um, the way it works is that you have a, we, we were working in one of the upper levels of the building, and, and there's a balcony outdoors. So over there, you have a, a, a sugar water feeder there permanently all the time. So bees already know that location. There's a few beehives uh, sort of on campus, but uh, they don't necessarily have to come from any of these uh, beehives either. They can come from anyone's uh, home, you know. Someone could have a beehive at their <laughs> home. They could come. Uh, and, and what you do is, um, the, the way you start an experiment is, the, the feeder water, the sugar feeder solution uh, outdoors in the balcony is, is not very strong. It, it, it's moderate. So it keeps the bees interested. So one bee comes along and then, you know, sort of tastes it and says, go back and does, does it. If it likes it, it goes back and does a dance and tells all the, all the other bees, hey, guys, there's something interesting. Come and check it out. So more and more bees come in and you have a steady stream of uh, stream of bees coming in and uh, visiting that feeder. Mm. Now, if you want to start, when you want to start an experiment, you, you, you take this, this feeder and then uh, move it in step by step into the lab, through the doorway, into the lab. And you can move the feeder forwards by, you know, about a foot. Uh, every five minutes. Oh, so, okay. uh, uh, quite, in fact, some people have found that bees can actually predict if, if you're steadily moving a feeder, they can actually predict the speed of movement of the feeder <laughs> and look ahead when they come next time on the next visit. So, wow, so they, they, they go, they predict the, the next location, huh? And you said that the sugar water was uh, weak at first. Is it? Are you strengthening it? Strengthening it as you move it? Yeah, up? we're strengthening yeah. it a bit. Guys, sorry, thanks for yeah. pointing it out. Yes, we're strengthening it. Uh, so to and it gets more bees excited, of course, and there's more and more bees coming in. Uh, and you're ready to start the experiment, but you don't want you know a hundred hundred bees visiting your apparatus, <laughs> right? Yeah. So what you do is uh, at that moment, what you do is when you got the right number of bees coming in, you mark them individually with uh, with colored dots, mm-hmm. um, and then. Uh, at the same time, you place another feeder uh, outside uh, the door, and that's a weaker sugar solution. And that acts like a sort of a decoy because uh, the new recruits that have been sort of recruited by these uh, very enthusiastic bees that are going back home and dancing, they come and look at the most obvious spot, which is the feeder outside, mm-hmm. and they have a taste of that sugar for all the solution. They say, ah, this is not as good as it's cracked up to be. It was a false alarm. And so they get disappointed. And don't come back again. Oh, okay. So that way you can control the number of bees that are coming in and make sure it's only the bees that you marked individually that keep coming again and again faithfully. And all the other bees, the sort of recruits come outside and get disappointed and they don't enter the lab so they don't disturb the experiment. A lot of what you have done with bees are behavioral experiments looking at, you know, how they navigate, right? So, you know, as they're coming in, I mean, you're going to, you, you can describe this much better than me, but as they're coming in, you're then having them fly through like different tubes and different you're putting different um, mm-hmm. optical mm-hmm. shapes mm-hmm. and patterns uh, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. shows mm-hmm. how their flight varies. And through this, you you found out a bunch of stuff. I don't know how would you summarize <laughs> some of what you've learned about how they do it. 
Well, I mean, uh, it all started with a fairly uh, random chance observation. Uh, we found that uh, when bees were entering our lab, some of them would take a shortcut and fly through a hole in, in, in the wall rather than uh, fly through the open door. Uh, and we noticed that when they flew through this hole, they were flying fairly precisely down the middle of the hole. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we wondered about that because how can they actually, um, you know, fly so precisely down the middle when in fact they cannot measure distances uh, the way we do because their stereo vision is sort of compromised because the two eyes are actually very close together. And if and my eyes are fairly far, far apart, they're about eight centimeters apart, I think. So if I look at my finger with uh, one eye and then with the other eye, the image of the finger is displayed between the two eyes, mm, right? Yeah. And so your 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 stereo your human sort of stereo system is uh, working out the triangulation. It's measuring that disparity or displacement and working out how far away your finger is. So that's how uh, two dimensional stereo works, mm. right? But if you now take these two eyes and move them progressively closer and closer together, to, until you come to the point where you have where an insect, when you, the two eyes are actually a couple of millimeters apart, that shift or disparity becomes very small, and it's very hard to measure. So uh, insects really cannot rely on stereo unless some object is very close, in which case you start to get a bigger shift, hmm. uh, angular shift, I should say. Um, so insects really have sort of, sort of uh, evolved or come to rely on a completely different way to see the world in 3D, and that's to actually move in the world actively hmm. and, and look at how rapidly images move you know, uh, at, uh, in their eyes as they move past them. And if something is nearby, it moves very rapidly if you move in a straight line. And that tells you that this rapid, this rapidity of eye movement tells you about well, image move motion, I should say, tells you that this object is very close. Whereas something is very distant, like a, you know, a hill or a clouds in the sky, uh, uh, those don't move very much at all uh, if you're moving in a straight line. And that tells you that those the, those objects are actually very far away. So insects have somehow evolved to uh, you know um, translate uh, image motion into three-dimensional object distance. And we're doing that too, unconsciously. You know, when we move we, with one eye closed, uh, we are in fact taking advantage of eye movements and uh, head movements and eye movements to to glean some information about the three-dimensional perception of the world. But this is all. This has come about starting from you know. This is I was saying uh, to go back to what I was saying. The bees flew down the middle, and we're saying, given the fact that these bees don't have stereo, how could they possibly be gauging the distance and balancing them on the two sides, right? So to, with one thing we wondered was, are they really sort of flying in, through the passage in such a way that the two rims seem to uh, move past their eyes, past the two eyes at the same speed? That's one way of balancing your sort of uh, position in the middle of the hole, right? That was your first guess? That was the first guess, yeah. <laughs> wow, okay. All right. How often does that happen? So, yeah. so was, this, this is, that was, was a very lucky guess. I mean, it could have been <laughs> wrong. I mean, so, so we put bees in this tunnel. And then we had, uh, in the old days, we had conveyor belts to move uh, the walls, you know, with that stripe patterns, and we'd move them. Of course, you had a perspex sheet in the middle to make sure there were no wind currents that could influence their flight. So the bees would, they were, would be flying down this tunnel to the end to get a food reward, and then they'd fly back. Mm -hmm. And we filmed their flight trajectory from above uh, to see how they flew when they flew down the tunnel. And when they flew down, when both walls were stationary, they flew fairly precisely down the middle. Well, give or take one or two centimeters, mm -hmm. but, you know, hey, bees are only human. They make mistakes, too. <laughs> but fairly precisely down the middle. Uh, however, when we took one of these walls and moved it in the same direction as the incoming bee, then the bees flew a lot closer to the moving wall. And we think this is because when the bee and the wall are moving the same direction, the image of velocity as seen by that eye is much lower, mm -hmm. right? So the bee thinks that wall is much further away, uh, so she moves closer to that wall to, to make up for Take it. Take it to the center. To where she, on, she thinks the center is. To the center, exactly. Yeah. She, she thinks she's centering, yeah. And exactly the opposite thing happens when you move this wall in the opposite direction to the bee's incoming uh, flight direction. Because then you've got a large image motion on this side, so the bee thinks, hey, there's something dangerously close to this, this wall, to, to the surface. I'm very close to the surface. I better move away from the surface to compensate. So this simple experiment really uh, taught us that bees really uh, are flying through these uh, passage, narrow passages safely by by balancing the optic flow, as, we, as they say, in the two eyes. And you can also make predictions about where should they position themselves if you move one of these walls at a certain speed, for example. You can do the little mathematical calculation uh -huh. uh, and work out where they should be, and it seems to fit really quite nicely. So uh, that seems to be the way they're actually flying down in the middle. Uh, but once we had the tunnel going, there's lots of other experiments we could sort of, things we could test. Uh, for example, control of flight speed, 
how do they control their speed? Uh, we we notice that um, if, they, if if it's a constant uh, width tunnel, uh, they fly um, at a fairly constant speed right through the tunnel. Initially, what we did was uh, when they're flying through this tunnel, uh, the walls were stationary. Now, what we did, they, they flew at a certain speed. Now, we moved both walls forward at a certain speed, uh -huh, uh -huh. and the bees increased their speed by the same amount as the wall speed. And when you move both walls backward, the bees slow down by the same amount as the wall speed. So what they're trying to do is to keep constant the angle of velocity of the image that the two eyes are experiencing as they fly through this environment. And this is one way of controlling or regulating your flight speed. When they're flying in an open field, though, for instance, right, when everything is essentially at infinity or, or something, uh, are they going yeah, exactly, max? Exactly, exactly. You, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Bingo, you, you hit the right question. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the next step, the next question is the tapered, the tapered tunnel. Uh. So if you fly them through a tapered tunnel, okay, initially the, the, the walls are fairly far apart and the bees are flying at a certain speed, uh, speed, speed okay. So by the way, that, that, that first experiment with the, with the, with the, with the, with the static uh, tunnel or the walls moving in the same direction backwards or forward uh, told us that they're trying to hold an angular velocity of about 300 degrees per second constant mm. as they're flying through this tunnel, right? Now, if you go to this tapered tunnel, which is wide to begin with and then narrows down, you find initially when they come in, they fly at a certain speed, fairly high, and as they progressively move into the tunnel and the tunnel narrows down, they fly slower and slower. So what seems to be happening is they're trying to measure, keep this image velocity constant throughout the passage, but initially uh, they're keeping it constant at some 300 degrees per second, let's say, and then as they go in closer, the walls are much uh, further, the walls are much closer, so it increases the angular velocity of the image, right? But the bees think they're speeding up, so they're mm -hmm. slowing down to compensate for that, and so they keep slowing down further and further until they reach the narrowest part of the tunnel, which is the neck, and then when, they, when it starts to flare up, flare out again, they, they speed up again. And even through this, this flare tapered tunnel, they're maintaining a constant image velocity of 300 degrees per second. This is a very nice way to ensure that when you're, when you're flying in a wide open environment, you fly fairly fast. Uh -huh. And when you enter a dense cluttered environment, you automatically slow down. And uh, the nice thing is you don't need to do uh, the standard thing that computer vision people and machine vision people would be doing to measure distances to various obstacles and saying, hey, what should my speed be? You just measure the global average image velocity so that when you're flying in an open meadow, you fly fairly fast. And when you enter a, a forest or something, you automatically slow down to an appropriate speed. So they must have an internal reference signal that they're trying to match, essentially, that 300 degrees per second. And so that's kind of exactly, like, a, exactly. in, in control theory terms, that would be the reference signal, but that would be an internal innate, I suppose, innate signal. I don't know if you meant um, meant it this way, but you said they think that they're slowing down or they think that they're speeding up, depending on how you manipulate their their environment. But then as they actually are slowing down or speeding up, they, they also must have an internal reference signal for the um, output of their wing um, expenditure, sure, right? So, sure, sure, sure. It, 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 I, I, I use that yeah, term just okay. to make the, uh, make the explanation right. more. <laughs> they could have uh, the, the thrust that you uh, exert with your wing beats, of course, is one thing. There's also the, uh, the airspeed. You, know, you could be flying against uh, you know, a headwind or tailwind. So uh, they, they have uh, many insects have these uh, hairs on the thorax and the... Um, and the abdomen the, and the antennae as well, which act as wind sensors, so airflow sensors, so they're measuring their airspeed as they fly through the environment. And, and these also, not, not very well studied, we don't know exactly how, to what extent it affects their flight behavior, but they're certainly there, those sensors are there. Huh. Yeah. So, so you solved uh, B, B um, flight, optic control of flight there. <laughs> well, well, there, there, there was there was one part of it. The the the, the more the, the, the next step. Can I describe the next step? Oh yeah, the, please. The I want to ask you about landing a, in a second too, because I, that, oh, that's, landing yeah. as well. Before we go into landing, this is this was more about uh, flying through the environment, going to a food source. Um, how how do bees work out how far they have flown? Because a bee that's gone to a particular food source has to come back and signal through its dance. Uh, how far it's flown, so, and, and it gives the information in polar coordinates, right? The distance as well as the direction mm -hmm. uh, to go. Uh, so the direction of the dance, the Weigel dance, uh, is, is a measure of the, uh, uh, indicates the direction in which to go. And the duration of the Weigel dance uh, has information about um, how far away the food source is. The longer the duration of the Weigel, 
the further away the food source mm-hmm. is. There's yeah. a roughly linear relationship between the two. Now, how did they work out how far uh, they've gone? Now, we're not the first ones to have done this. Uh, Carl von Frisch, you know, the Nobel laureate who... Uh, who did all the wonderful work and on bees, every aspect of bees, um, looked at this too. And he did something really quite clever. What he did was he had bees uh, flying from a hive to a feeder, uh, and he sort of uh, 500 meters away, let's say, uh, quite some distance away. And when they came back, he, he uh, looked at their dance and filmed it. They, they, they were indicating, uh, you know, uh, they were they'd calibrated it for 500 meters. And then he put these tiny lead weights on the bees and made them fly the same distance. And when they came back, they were now reporting a much larger distance. Mm. So uh, von Frisch decided that this was probably a, 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 they're using a measure of energy consumed to signal the flight distance, right? That seems like the okay. most obvious thing mm. when you're carrying a weight. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a sort of. But we think that may not be the case. So what? So what? What we did was the following. So we we trained bees to fly down this tunnel again, a very short tunnel. Uh, in this case, it was about, I think, about eight meters, uh, a fairly short, narrow tunnel to a feeder, and then come back. And even though they'd flown only this very short distance of eight meters, they were signaling something like 300 meters in their dances. They were being comprehensively, they were comprehensively overestimating the distance. And we wondered, why is, why is this going hmm. on? And one of the possibilities was that they could be measuring not this flight energy consumed, but actually measuring how far the image of the world, how much the image of the world had moved past their eyes as they fly from the, uh, uh, you know, from their hive to the to the food source. Mm-hmm. So they're measuring it visually. Now the the thing is, um, because because the walls of the sun are very narrow, even a small amount of forward motion causes a huge amount of image motion, mm-hmm. right? So the things have gone a long way. So it's a bit like, you know, if I were to uh, fly from, uh, let's say, Brisbane to Sydney and look down at the ground, the ground is so far away, it wouldn't appear to be right. moving at all. So I wouldn't think I've gone a long right. way. Whereas if I were to drive from Brisbane to Sydney, everything is very close to me. There's a lot of image motion, and I think I've gone a long mm-hmm. way. So we think that the odometry, uh, the bees' odometer, is working visually. And the way to test this, of course, is to remove that uh, image cue uh, that image motion cue and see what happens. So if you, uh, normally the tunnel would have a textured pattern, a randomly textured pattern or, or, or vertical black and white stripes. But if you, if you change that and make the stripes horizontal, then when the bees are flying down the tunnel, the same tunnel, they don't experience any optic flow because they're flying parallel to the stripes. And then when, when they come back home, they dance again, but signal almost zero distance. Right? right. So, right. so they really are, so it looks like the vis- odometer is really visually driven. What we think went wrong with, the, well, not wrong, it was the wrong interpretation maybe, with Carl von Fischer's experiment was that when you load these bees, they probably tend to fly closer to the ground. Oh. That increases the optic flow produced by the ground, and so they, you know, their odometer is telling them they're going much further distance. That's a nice segue into the landing. I, I want to come back also to, to, <laughs> to, to, I mean, there's a lot of questions I have, but um, I don't know maybe if that's the right, if this is the right time then, because their landing is, is con- controlled, I suppose, by this uh, uh, very similar optical flow kind of um, system, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. So the, 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 the same system that keeps the, uh, the flight speed constant or tries to keep the image velocity constant at about 300 degrees per second when they're cruising, that same thing is put to a different use when they're landing because we thought, okay, the way we did this was to simply train bees to come and land on a, uh, on a drop of sugar water placed on a horizontal um, textured surface. Uh, it could even be a wooden, uh, you know, table with some with some grain, so that you could there's some texture that they can see. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and uh, and if we filmed them in three dimensions as they came into land, uh, and uh, analyzed the, the the flight trajectory data, and we found that um, it's a very simple thing. When they're flying high, they're flying fairly fast, and they fly low, they're flying slow. And in fact, the speed of flight, the speed of approach, I should say, um, to the target, is very strictly proportional to the height above the surface. And what that is telling us is that they're actually, as they're coming in, uh, they're keeping the image velocity of the ground constant, constant in their eyes as they're coming into land, right? If you, if you were sitting in a plane, for example, and looking out the window at the ground uh, beneath you as a pilot is coming into land, as you get closer and closer to the ground, you'll find that the image of the ground appears to move faster and faster, right? But that's because the pilot is not slowing down. The bee doesn't do that. The pilot comes in at a constant velocity. Mm. The bee slows down appropriately at every time to keep the image velocity constant. 
And this automatically ensures that when it's coming back very close to the ground, it's flying with almost zero velocity, so it doesn't burn its feet when it makes contact with the ground. So it's a very nice low impact landing strategy. And the beauty about this is you don't need to know at any time how far away you are from the surface. Mm. Mm. You don't need to know you don't need to know how rapidly you're approaching it. All you need to do is to measure the image velocity initially and keep that constant. Adjust your speed to keep that constant as you're coming in to land and bingo, you've done it, right? <laughs> There's a beautiful biological autopilot to make a nice smooth landing. Yeah, it's an elegant and very simple way. Yeah, I was just right. So that was on the horizontal surface. But what we then did was to look at landings on, on, on a vertical surface like this, where the bee has to come and dock, you know, for example, a flower or something. When you do a grazing landing on a horizontal surface, the image velocity, the image motion is mainly from front to back on, on, in, in, in your eye as you look down below, mm-hmm. right, in, in your ventral field of view. Whereas if you, if you, if you dock a flower, you know, to approach a vertical plane, for example, a flower on a vertical plane, uh, what you see is a sort of an expanding sort of an image, it's like uh, watching a Star Wars movie or something like that. Mm. <laughs> different pattern of optic flow. <laughs> uh, so we also wanted to know whether, you know, what do I do? Do use a different strategy for landing on horizontal surfaces as opposed to vertical surfaces because the pattern of optic flow is different. So we tried to do this by having bees come in and land on a vertical um, sort of a pattern. But the pattern in this case had uh, a spiral on it. And I'll tell you what the reason for the spiral. But uh, first of all, we found that as the bee came in and approached the thing, it again did the same behavior. So when it was uh, far away from the spiral, it was flying, approaching fairly fast. As it came closer and closer to the thing, it slowed down progressively. And again, a nice linear relationship between approach velocity and distance to the actual landing target, mm-hmm. right? So we thought again, okay, it must be something to do with image motion. But now the nice thing about the spiral, because you, the bees are exp- experiencing a kind of an expanding pattern, right, as they approach the target. That's what happens when you approach a, uh, approach a target uh, frontally. You see uh, something expanding. Now, what the nice thing about the spiral is you can artificially manipulate the rate of expansion by spinning the spiral in, in, a, in a way as to make it either expand or contract. Mm-hmm. When you rotate the spiral to make it appear to expand, you are increasing the apparent rate of expansion that the bees experience as they approach the target. We find that the bees then hit the brakes and approach the target more slowly in order to maintain the original rate of expansion. On the other hand, when the spiral is rotated to create an apparent contraction, the bees approach the target more rapidly. The simple experiment tells us that the landing bees are approaching the spiral in such a way as to hold the apparent rate of expansion of its image constant. So that simple experiment uh, tells us that really are they, they're doing the same thing. They're just keeping whatever. It doesn't matter whether you're approaching a horizontal surface or, or an oblique surface or a perpendicular surface, all you have to do is to look at that total optic flow that the surface is generating around the target that you're going towards and keep that flow constant. No matter what it is, just keep that, hold that constant as you're coming into land and you've done your job. So it's a very simple, simple, elegant way of thinking, which we wouldn't have even thought about until we started to uh, look at these bees by doing a very simple experiment and measuring their flight <laughs> as they landed. Well, you know a lot more about... Um uh engineered flying flying systems and I, so i wanted to ask you about robotics in a second but just as an aside um you know one of the things you were talking about how when you change um their perception of how fast they're flying or how uh slow they're flying etc um they will come and report in, through their waggle dance uh incorrect distances right incorrect distances mm-hmm. and directions mm-hmm. however um, as you point out in, in some of your talks, it doesn't matter because if the other bees take that same route, they're going to have that same error. So it, it, so it's a fine dance. Exactly, you know. So yeah, yeah. So it, it so so it, it, if a bee flies through an open environment, if I'm at meters, it'll come back and signal some distance. But if fly if it flies the same uh, through a different environment and flies the same distance, for example, through a forest, mm-hmm. it'll come back and signal a much bigger distance. But as it turns out, you know, the, all the bees that follow the dancing bee will take the same route as the bee took, the original the original scout bee took, right? So they'll change the same environment. So, you know, it doesn't matter if your ruler, your measuring yardstick or something is not perfectly calibrated because, you know, as long as all bees use the same yardstick, it doesn't matter. It's, it, it, everything cancels out, right? Right. So that's, that's the thing, I think. Yeah. So it's really tied to uh, the perceptual capabilities and skills of, in this case, bees. Uh, what I was going to ask you is, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about ecologically valid studies and umwelts, uh, you know, like the different yeah. <laughs> organisms' relations, like the, the their specific environment and what they're evolutionarily mm-hmm. honed for. 
So does this, mm. in your eyes, does this tell you that um, what we are perceiving as organisms uh, isn't necessarily mm-hmm. veridical, as in the real world, but ba- it's just based on our perceptions. And if you and I share the same perception systems, uh, we're going to make the same errors, but they're not errors to us because we're following our own subjective, evolutionarily honed uh, ab- yeah, abilities. E- e- exactly, exactly. You know, I, 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 I would say that, you know, no organism perceive the whole world uh, in its total reality uh, as it is, I would say. You know, I don't think there's a totally true or complete representation of the world in any creature, you know, including humans. What? You know, or for that matter, even, <laughs> in the, even in the machine. Because right. you know, each animal experiences the world through the window of its own visual and perceptual capacities, right, and its limitations. For example, insects have poorer spatial acuity than humans. Mm. So they, their, their vision is not as sharp as us. Uh, so there's, but uh, their visual resolution is, I think, is only a factor of six, factor of sixty poorer than humans. But they have much higher temporal acuity. They can see the flicker in the fluorescent lamp, for example, which is flickering. Uh, well, in your country, it's uh, 60, sixty hertz, isn't it? Yeah, so I think so. Sixty, so one hundred and twenty flashes per second, mm. and they can they can see that clearly, whereas we cannot. So we our eyes are sluggish. But sharp, especially, and there's there there there's are, are sort of not that sharp in terms of spatial resolution, but uh, they're very very rapid responding, and so that they need that because they're flying through dense environments and things are very close to them, so they want to see lots of objects without blur when things are moving rapidly past their eyes. Um, and insects can see in the ultraviolet, which we cannot. Right. Uh, they can see patterns in flowers, ultraviolet marker patterns in flowers, which bees use to lead them to the nectar. We cannot see that. They can perceive polarized light in the sky, which we cannot. So the visual world is entirely different from ours, you know. So uh, uh, what is really real, it's hard to be decide, right? Is the eagles have higher visual acuity than us. They can see much, you know, much better resolution than us. So, um, yeah, so there's, every person has their own world, I think. And even across humans, you know, we I don't know if we can say that all humans perceive and recognize objects in the same way. I mean, uh, both you and I could agree, look at a car and say, okay, this is a particular model of Ford. But, you know, whether your brain responds in the same way as mine does, uh, I don't think we know yet, right? Right. And even even if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. As long as we both agree, I mean, you have a certain pattern of activation in your neurons that says this is a model Ford. And mine says, okay, it has a different pattern of activation, but I've learned to, that that is a model Ford. That's right. So we both agree it's a model Ford, but the representation might be quite different, right? We can't be sure. And you're red and my red. Who knows, who, who knows if they're the same, right? <laughs> exactly, <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> Well, let's. Um, do you want to shift and talk a little bit about uh, the robotics that you've been developing? Also, I, I know you have a few projects mm-hmm. that have been uh, directly based on these optic flow studies in uh, insect navigation. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, the way we got into robotics also was quite uh, sort of accidental because uh, you know we were really look at doing basic bee research, and then uh, at one stage, uh, some, somebody from uh, DARPA uh-huh. who happened to uh, be at a conference where I was talking. Uh, sort of approached uh, me later and said, hey, would you like to get some money to <laughs> work on developing uh, the biologically inspired studies for flying machines? And uh, it sounded like a good idea. We didn't go, didn't go looking for it, but we huh. sort of got enticed into it. And <laughs> oh, I, I really, I, I was imagining that uh, you had that in your kind of back pocket the whole time coming from that engineering background. No, it's, it's strange. Yeah, it's strange. As an engineer, I, yeah, it's so stupid that I didn't, <laughs> didn't even think about it. Uh, <laughs> Even even the uh, thing about navigating safely down a corridor by balancing the optic flow, uh, the, the first people to actually uh, pick up that idea and use it to navigate robots were was not people from from our lab. It was people in the labs in Italy and in yeah. France and so on. So they they were using it and they say, "Hey, my God, why didn't we do that?" But you know, we weren't really uh, we were really looking for. Uh, we're just having fun with these insects. <laughs> it's enjoyable work, isn't it? Yeah, it, 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 that's right. I mean, we, we weren't, I mean, nowadays, of course, I think the way research goes is that you tend to be more application-oriented. You have to be that way because your your success in a, in a grant application depends very much on yeah. how you can tout how, how, how relevant this research is going to be. That, again, is something was something that was not there in the old days, which is something I, again, miss very much. <laughs> you have to either cure cure disease or build a good robot or something yeah. like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Bingo, you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know, yeah. So, okay. Do so, something useful, yes. <laughs> so it was the, it was the DARPA, um, DARPA money that, that got this off the ground, so to speak, pun intended. Exactly, there. exactly, yeah. exactly. So we're very thankful to DARPA for that. Of course, in a way, working for a military funding organization, we're also involved in that with the U.S. Air Force and uh, uh, Office of Naval Research and so on mm-hmm. later on. 
but uh, there's good in that. You always worry about whether, uh, you know, uh, what you do could be used, uh, right? Uh, you know, incorrectly and things like that. But it turned out it was actually very good. DARPA especially was really very, uh, uh, very keen on f f sort of uh, promoting basic research. They wanted us to publish our work in good journals. They were not trying to keep it classified or anything like that. So uh, I really appreciated that. Hmm. Well, one of the things that you uh, have worked on, and I don't know how many of these different robotic systems you want to talk about, but one of them is like a a, a bi winged plane, like a kind of a standard model plane. But then, mm, but then mm, you install mm, kind mm. of a fly navigation system using the principles. That's right. That's right. But that's right, before that's right, before that's right. I, I'd like you to describe mm -hmm. that. But so there's there's this there's this kind of tired trope, right? Of um, how much biological detail do we need to build into, for example, AI, right, into artificially intelligent systems? And often the example people use is, well, we, we didn't, um, you don't want to build wings to uh, build flight. You want to use the principle of airlift and aerodynamics, right? However, not all flight is the same. So sure, if you just want lift and propulsion, that's all you need. But if you want mm. fancy kinds of flight forward and backward and uh, if you mm. want to navigate in certain ways, then you do need something closer to wings. But um, so, so th there's this ever present, um, at least in the in the AI world, right? That, that a lot of what we talk about is how much biological um, detail do you really need to build in? But yeah. so yeah. how you know how did you decide what to build in and in yeah. which systems? So so yeah yeah um, our our sort of uh, way of thinking about this right? it's a very good question there, Paul. Yeah, and the way we considered it was to say, okay, you. It depends on the task you need to uh, accomplish. I mean, you don't need to be necessarily slavishly biomimetic in the sense that you copy everything that you see in the insect. For example, you don't need to build an insect compound eye with you know thousands of facets. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You don't need to have flapping wings. Uh, our, our idea was to basically test to see whether the principles we extract from from um, honeybee vision, flight and navigation and guidance, for example, do they really, can you use optic flow information to do all the things that insects do? So what we do is we we put put together a vision system to emulate the almost panoramic vision of an insect compound eye, two, well, two eyes actually. Uh, so the, we did, did this by placing two wide angle cameras back to back. So that gave you an almost near, uh, facing this way, one, one, this, one this side, one the other side. So it gave you a nearly panoramic vision, except for a small kind of blind zone in the back. Um, so that, 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 that was the thing that we're using. And we're using standard computer vision techniques to measure the image motion, the optic flow. We were not trying to you do it exactly how the insect does it, because we still don't know, by the way, exactly how the insect measures true optic flow. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, we didn't want to wait for that to happen. We said, okay, this time we put on an engineering hat and uh, measure optic flow uh, using the traditional well-known techniques. And we're using this to control the flight speed, to regulate the height above the ground. So this is a fixed-wing aircraft, as you said, with with the uh, nose cone. Uh, the propeller in the nose cone was removed and mounted on the top of the wings to make room for the vision system, which was in the front. Okay. So you get a nice clear view of the front. So the optic flow is used to control the flight speed, to regulate the height above the ground, to compute the distance traveled using odometry, like we were, like like bees do. How how big is this thing? Uh, this, uh, it's, it's about, uh, I think the span was about a meter and a half. Oh, okay. Pretty big, pretty good size. Yeah. Fairly big. Yeah. So we weren't trying to miniaturize uh, at that stage. We were just trying to basically see, you know, proof of principle kind of thing to see if, uh, these ideas actually work. Uh, and, uh, it seems to, it seemed to work quite well. So the other thing we put in, which we hadn't done in our own research, but others had done is to, um, uh, use the horizon profile, uh, panoramic horizon profile to control the attitude, measure, monitor, and control the attitude of the aircraft. Mm. So you see, for example, if you're flying and then you, 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 the horizon appears to move up in your left eye and down in your right eye, it means you've uh, rolled or banked to the left, yeah, mm -hmm. and vice mm -hmm. versa. Whereas if the horizon appears to move up in, your, uh, in, in the front, it means you pitch, you're pitching down, uh, and if it moves down, you're pitching up, mm -hmm. right? So, so you, can, you can use the horizon profile all, all around you to, to monitor and stabilize your, your attitude. But assuming that you're not flying in a canyon or something where the horizon right. is not you know, flat, <laughs> the world is not flat, right. and you've got uh, things sticking up on one side or the other when you could get misled. But if you're flying high enough above the ground, uh, the horizon is usually very reliable. And it doesn't, uh, nice thing about it is that it's got a 
it's got a reference which does not drift with time, unlike many of these inertial sensors, which actually errors accumulate with time because they're integrating, you know, angular motions. And the noise tends to uh, make uh, cause all kinds of drift problems and things like that. Hmm. So we found that this could really be used to stabilize the orientation of the aircraft and it, 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 it basically its roll and pitch. And so uh, also you can use the horizon profile to do various aerobatic maneuvers. So for example, all you need to do is to say, okay, I want the horizon profile, the shape of the horizon profile to vary from this shape to that shape to that shape as a function of time. And you can do beautiful things like loops and rolls and Immelman turns and all kinds of things. Uh, just by using a horizon profile. We don't know if insects use it. We don't know if insects do it that way. Uh, uh, they do lots of aerobatic maneuvers too. Uh, and sometimes they do it without, the, without the, even in the absence of a horizon. So they must be using other sensors as well. But we found that at least with the horizon, we could do all these things, not just uh, you know go from A to B and do a smooth flight, uh, but also do these uh, interesting aerobatics. And the nice thing was that these flights are completely autonomous, kind of take off, cruise, uh, control turns and landing back in the airstrip, and they're done without using any external information such as GPS or radar. So you're being entirely self-sufficient and self-reliant, just the way an insect or a bird would be, right? And so it's a nice backup system for when there's a drop drop off drop out of GPS or radio information and things like that. Well, I was going to ask, how, how does this compare? I don't even know how autopilot works. So like like uh, current autopilot systems, right? They're well, uh, they're using uh, radar. Yeah, well, to, to 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 yeah, to to the best of my knowledge, they're relying entirely on GPS. The pilot, you know, basically takes the plane off, and then and then yeah. they basically sit back and relax, and the the plane is guided by GPS all the way through uh, until it comes to land. And again, even the landing, uh, I I know I've known some pilot friends who tell me even the landing, there's a landing beacon, there's a radar, you know, which sort of. Uh, Helps you yeah. come down the thing. Uh, you, you stay, stay, as long as you stay within the beam, the plane automatically stays within the beam of a uh, thing that's being projected up from the ground, right? So it follows that beam down. Huh. And it is so precise. Unless something goes wrong, uh, I've been told it's so precise that when it lands on the runway, it lands directly in the middle of the runway so that there's a little cat size in the middle of the runway. They're hitting against the nose wheel and they're going mm. bump, bump, bump. So the only pilot intervention is to actually steer the aircraft slightly away from the middle wow. <laughs> to get rid of to get to, to, to get rid of this bumping noise. So they're so precise and, and but they all rely on external information, you see? Uh, and so if something goes wrong, this is where I think something like what we're doing could be helpful because you can then at least for some 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 period of time you can be self sufficient. Mm. Uh, long range navigation becomes a problem because you know auto materials and all these things will start to build up and you can't really rely on that forever but at least in the for a short term you can manage without any of these things that you're normally very crucially relying on so okay so that was the um, fixed wing aircraft but you also worked on like smaller miniature uh smaller f- flight systems as well right so, uh, quadrated drones and things like that yeah. yeah so that was um mainly uh to uh to see if the same thing would work in, in when you had uh, things things like um, you know vertical takeoff and landing uh, systems uh and uh doing things like it was it was easier to do this on a smaller scale because we were uh, we were uh, flying in a, you know, didn't have to go to an airstrip every time to uh, run these uh, tests. We could do it right on campus. And we were also doing things like um, um, developing algorithms for detecting other moving objects in the environment, which is actually quite an interesting challenge uh, because, um, uh, you know, uh, we are so good at even when we're moving, uh, we can detect small objects that are moving in the environment, right? Like another car or a bicycle or something right. like that. Uh, and you cannot just do it by uh, measuring motion because uh, if, you're, if you're stationary, uh, the world is, the image of the world is stationary, and if something moves within it, you can pick it up. When, but you're moving, the image of the whole world is moving in your eye. And within that, to pick something that's moving and decide whether it's really moving or just part of the world moving <laughs> past yeah. you is quite a, tr- quite a challenge, even for computer vision scientists. And, and animals and, and humans are also so good at it. So we were developing algorithms that would sort of allow um, a sort of a detection of moving a movement of self self moving objects. The, the detection of movement of self moving objects. Well, that, that's right. You teach people how to creep up on other people without being noticed. <laughs> that's the other thing. There's a motion camouflage as well. That's the other thing. Uh, that's the other thing that we didn't probably didn't get into. The insects will camouflage their own motion. Yeah. Uh, when they, there's a lot of stealth there, and we did a bit of study and modeling of that too. I could talk a little bit about that if you if you would like. Yeah, I don't know if that's the work with the dragonflies that um, 
Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Can yeah. you just describe that? Because that's really that, neat that's stuff. That's something we would. That's something we. That, that's something we put into aircraft as well. So just see if, right. we, if we can get it get it right. to work. Yeah. So the idea is very simple. So uh, a couple of ways in which you can do it is uh, uh, one is to uh, move in such a way that you're, you're you're maintaining a constant angle of bearing with respect to the. Uh, see if you're if you're there's a shadower and a shadow e right. So you're the shadower. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So you move in such a way that the line joining you with 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 the shadowy always is at a constant orientation. If that's the case, then it looks like you're an object at infinity because you're not moving in, you're not moving in the eye of the uh, uh, shadower, and so it, no danger is perceived. Uh, the other way you could do it is to actually pivot about a, a fixed point behind you as you're as you're uh, sort of tracking the shadower. That way, the shadower thinks it's just a stationary object over there, right? So uh, it can't be possibly coming towards me. And so as long as you don't get too close and you reveal, reveal any expansion cues in your in your image, uh, you, you can shatter in that way. And it turns out that hoverflies do that, dragonflies do that. And yeah, so there's a lot of that sort of thing going on. Yeah, motion camouflage, as we call it. So they've, they've learned through evolution this natural mathematical relationship between which camouflages mm. their motion. relative, And that's how they intersect, intercept uh, and... Uh, consume other flying objects essentially right exactly yeah. exactly exactly yeah i'm just it's, I'm picturing humans trying to do that is seems like a lot of effort to uh camouflage it, it yeah. uh, i've experienced it myself not in terms of someone shadowing me but shadowing me but if, if you're moving along and driving somewhere like this and uh, there's another road coming in from the side and the car is moving on, along the road maintain that constant angular bearing you tend not to notice it until it's uh, quite close oh it's interesting People also done uh, psychophysical experiments with human beings after we published that paper, and then they 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 found the same thing that humans can also be fooled by the same thing. Is that right? It seems like a a fun thing to try, but um, I'm not sure that that would be well, time well spent. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's stealth is a very interesting thing for the military, as as, as we all oh, know. Oh, that's <laughs> true. Yeah. See, this is where the nefarious purposes come in. So we should move on. But so so far, we've talked all about like the navigational abilities and flight abilities uh, of insects. But you've also studied, um, quote unquote, higher level cognition in in bees. And I, I don't, you know, before we, maybe you can give us some examples, you know, like, uh, f- well, uh, you know, I can just list some off. For example, that uh, b- bees have working memory up to like five seconds. They can do delayed match to sample tasks, which is like a standard mm-hmm. uh, kind of task. They can count up to at least, I think, what is it, four? And then anything, there's like one, two, three, four, mm-hmm. and then everything above four is another category or something mm-hmm. like that, right? Mm-hmm. I want to ask you though, like what your so, so maybe before you give uh, another example or, or or your favorite example, you know how how far we've come in terms of learning about what bees uh, and insects are capable of cognitively, but also your own how you, your mind has um, I don't know want to say I don't want to say changed, but developed in terms of thinking about bees' capabilities and. You know, have you come to respect bees more over the years through like learning their abilities and or or, or what? How 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 has your own outlook on bees changed over the years? I suppose. Yeah, yeah, sure. Very, very good questions for Paul. So, so let's start quickly by summarizing uh, what we found in terms of the bees. Sure, uh, that'd be great. Uh, perceptual capacities, yeah. and and then then we could uh, talk about yeah the, the broader aspects. If that's sure. okay. Yeah. The, Sure. So, uh, you know, for a long time, uh, bees and other insects were really considered to be rather simple reflexive automatons that would learn just very simple associations. For example, uh, the blue dish carries a food reward, the yellow dish, uh, no food. So you can train bees to choose the blue over the yellow very quickly. By the way, bees will learn these things at very quickly. Four or five rewards is all it takes. Five minutes. Wow. Well, they <laughs> so, don't have long. They have to learn fast. Say five minutes, maybe half okay. an hour. They have to go back home and come back again. Yeah. So, you know, uh, okay, five rewards. And half an hour, and they've learned the color. But it seems like, so uh, pattern recognition in bees has gone a lot beyond this uh, over the last uh, few decade, decades. So they're, they're not just learning, for example, with learning um, shapes of flowers or something uh, or, in, or objects. They're not really learning them in a photographic way, you know, a little eidetic way, as they say, it, you know, pixel for pixel, memorizing the, the, the content of the image, you know, pixel by pixel. They're able to learn abstract properties of patterns and categorize them in more general ways as well. So, for example, they can learn the concept of orientation, the concept of orientation in a rather general way. 
So you can train them to distinguish between, let's say, uh, horizontal and vertical uh, random gratings. Uh, and when I say random, I mean from time to time, every visit, the grating is, has, has a different pattern of uh, black and white stripes. It's not the mm -hmm. same regular stripe. So, and, and they, so they learn that, that, to do that. And then you can try and test them on other patterns, other oriented patterns, for example, um, sinusoidal gratings or even single stripes, you know, mm -hmm. which possess the same uh, orientation uh, combination. One is vertical, the other is horizontal. So if they were rewarded on the horizontal random grating, they will pick the horizontal stripe or the horizontal sinusoidal grating or the horizontal row of dots as opposed to the vertical. So they can generalize this concept of orientation and learn it in a fairly general way and, and apply it to other objects that they haven't even seen before, right? Uh, uh, that's something. There's also our, one of our studies showed that uh, bees also possess uh, things that you would call uh, top-down processing. So, uh, for example, uh, you've probably seen this uh, famous picture of a, uh, a Dalmatian against a spotted black and white background. Yeah. Uh, and it's camouflaged, right? Because you cannot pick out the silhouette very easily. Uh, but what happens is that if you once you're given a cue and so shown, a, you know, a, a solid black sort of figure, like an outline of the dog, then you never look at that same picture in the same right. way, right? I mean, because you, once you've right. seen that 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 prior information in, in your head pops out and sort of goes down and picks out the signal from the noise, and because it knows what it's looking for. So, and it turns out that bees can also be trained to uh, break camouflage in this way. So. Uh, so, so this is the way we went was that we did was to um, show them camouflaged patterns. Uh, so one, for example, could be a textured ring presented against a textured background, a randomly textured background. They're both the ring and the background are textured, randomly mm -hmm. textured. And the other case, on the other side, you have a, of this Y maze, you have a, a disc, uh, a randomly textured disc presented against a randomly textured background. There's some distance between the, the foreground uh, target and the background uh, wall. Uh, uh, so, so I'll, I'll tell you why. But initially, when you try to make them distinguish, distinguish, distinguish between these two things, they can't learn it. They cannot learn it at all because both patterns appear camouflaged. But then, if you train them on on uh, uncamouflaged versions of the same objects, one is a solid black ring, and the other is a solid black disc presented against a textured background, uh, they can see these discs very easily, and and they will learn, for example, the, that the ring is the one to uh, go for to get mm. the food. And then you present these bees with the camouflage objects. And then immediately, once the bees have been pre-trained, they will pick the camouflage objects right away, the camouflage ring, without even needing to be further trained on it. So they've learned the trick of breaking the camouflage, and they're now using it. And not only that, you can now, you can now train them on totally novel camouflage objects. And again, they will learn to do that without needing to be pre-trained. Because they've learned how to break the camouflage, and the way to break the camouflage is to actually, when you're coming towards the object, you move a little from side to side, and then because the object is slightly closer to you than the, uh, than the background, you get this motion parallax between the object and the background, and that makes the object pop out and reveal itself. And they, so they've learned to use this mouth motion camouflage to, to take advantage of or exploit it. So you can train a bee to look at the world in new ways, which you haven't, which you haven't done before, right? <laughs> Because normally they probably wouldn't need to do it. <laughs> well, right. I was, that's one of my questions. Was um, so that speaks to maybe to the capacity of you know what they're capable of, but um, maybe they wouldn't necessarily ever use that in their own ecological. Yeah, that, that's the funny thing. You see, lots of these things. That's what's amazed me so much. Because even though it's not part of their natural, uh, you know, requirement or the natural history, they can learn these things. They're a bit like a lab rat in the sense that, you know, you can make right. lab rats do things that you right. normally, yeah, yeah, you're, you're trying to test specific. They're like that. Uh, and, and that's what's really cool about them. And this is done by a very small brain with a far, you know, smaller number of neurons and, and, and yeah. Well, it's yeah. still, I mean, if one aspect is just that it's impressive that um, brains have such high capacity, neural systems have such high capacity. But do you, is it just a matter of... Pattern matching, or there is there some symbolic uh, cognition going on there? I think it's symbolic because all of these things, for example, the the simple uh, task of orientation, for example, it's not just simply uh, photographic pattern matching, right? Because it it really wouldn't would wouldn't work if it was that. It it have to be some yeah. uh, generalization, yeah. Um, uh, isn't it? A again, uh, when they when they when you train them to fly through mazes, for example, they can learn to. Uh, uh, a simple way to guide them through a maze is to make them follow a symbol that's tacked on each one of the chambers through the maze and just learn to follow the symbol. 
but you can do it in a slightly more abstract way by using the symbol as a guidepost. You can say, okay, if the if this wall carries the, is yellow in color, it means you've got to turn left. If it is blue in color, you've got to turn right. So they're using these things in a, not as guideposts, but actually, well, it's sort of a guidepost, but much more abstract. It's a symbolic uh, kind of guidepost, right? It's at least toward abstract symbolism. Yeah, I don't know if, how much I don't know how much we actually use symbols either. So there's that question as well. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying bees are superhuman. No, please don't get me wrong. But it's amazing what they can do. <laughs> okay, that was just a reality check there. I was just testing you. <laughs> but but you have like come to appreciate bee cognition a lot more, and and re, you know uh, respect the bee as an organism probably through your studies. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, when you grow up as a kid, all you're trained to do is to avoid bees because they'll sting you, right? I mean, <laughs> but, I mean, uh, but we really, uh, it's amazing. A bee doesn't really, it's not as aggressive in any way. The only time it stings you is when it perceives a threat because it dies when it stings you, right? It bleeds to death. So it's not in its interest to sting you anyway. My daughter wanted me to ask you about bee stinging, but <laughs> I'm going to refrain. <laughs> oh, yeah. When, when, especially when they're foraging, they're in a, in a beautifully peaceful state of mind. All they want to do is to come there, get their food, and go away. When, in fact, when they're feeding at your feeder, you can even reach over and stroke their backs with your mm. finger. And uh, they, they, they won't even notice. They're, they're just blissfully drinking their, their, their sugar water. It's only when they perceive a threat to the hive or something that they get aggressive and come and defend the, the hive. And that's the only time when they, when they, when they sting. But what I've learned from you is that if I accidentally threaten a hive and I anger a few bees, what I should do is take my fingers and move them really fast so that they kind of <laughs> go, go further away, right? That's funny. <laughs> thing. That's, away. <laughs> that's one thing. But they have also say that they get attracted by movement. That's for sure. We also looked at the experiments. Oh. We haven't published them, but they do get attracted to moving objects. So they, 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 uh, <sighs> one of the lessons that beekeepers tell you is to not move, to freeze uh, when you when you perceive a bee as uh, about to attack you, you can actually hear the the, the the wing beat uh, increases in frequency, so you can hear the raised pitch that's coming to get at you. But uh, it's it's instinctively very difficult to freeze at that time. You really want to get the hell out of there, you know. And so it's a very hard thing to do to just uh, uh, <laughs> just wait there and hope it'll go away. But if it does get into your hair or something, they say the best way to sort of get rid of that problem is not to really uh, you know rub your hair like this and try to get it out because that gets them even more nervous and they will definitely sting your scalp. Uh, the best way to do that, get, you know, deal with that situation is basically wha- whack your head and kill the bee, kill the poor bee. But but that's the best way to do it because well, it's going to die anyway. Uh, Even if it stings you, it's going to die. Right. So, <laughs> right. That's, that's okay. Cope, uh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll pass that on to my daughter. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the other thing you should pass on to your daughter is that she can do all these experiments in her own backyard. She doesn't oh, even yeah. have to have a. She doesn't even need to have a beehive. Right. That's she, cool. She can just play sugar water, a sugar water feeder in, 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 the, in the backyard, and I can show you some feeder water designs if you want to set them up. And, and um, she can do all that. To, she, uh, somebody, a neighbor could have a beehive, and she could just uh, mark some of these bees in the thorax. I can send some information on how to mark them carefully and so on. And she can have a lot of fun training them to learn colors and this and that, uh, totally in the backyard. Oh, and, that's uh, awesome. No, no, at no expense. <laughs> You gave me a month's worth of uh, of science lessons. I'm in charge of the homeschooling, <laughs> the science part. I, I do dad science, quote unquote. Good, so good, this is great. this will be a that's really great. fun project. This is great. Yeah. That'll be great. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you think it's silly for uh, neuroscientists to be studying higher level, higher level, like well, bigger brained animals like monkeys, et cetera, when there's still so much to learn from such small, you could say more tractable? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, th- I, th- I think it should go in parallel. You know, I think it should go in parallel. I mean, the the the, the sad thing now is that I think some of these smaller creatures, because of funding constraints and so on, they're, they're being pushed to one side, and it's hard to hard and harder to find funding, right. research funding yeah. for looking at these uh, smaller creatures. And and uh, sometimes you may discover things of, as I say. Some of the neural basis for some of these uh, cognitive things, uh, because the bee is. Uh, the bee brain is so small, and it's, uh, it's just about a milligram, and it has only about a million neurons. And you compare that to a human brain that has over a kilogram, I think, in weight, and uh, about 100 billion neurons, including the glial cells. It's a lot of neurons. Right around there. there. And there, there's yeah. no neocortex in a bee either, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, so the th- thing is, if, if you happen to uh, you know, uh, hit upon something when you're recording for some of these neurons, uh, it may give us insights about uh, what's happening across all, a number of species, right, without being distracted by all of these other things that uh, higher creatures have, which uh, that's the thing. You see, uh, you have the bare bones kind of stripped down version of uh, 
several cognitive yeah. uh, sort of capacities that are there in these simpler creatures, which you might be able to unearth uh, if you're lucky uh, in some of these simpler creatures, I feel. We started off this conversation, you talked about how bees are these great learning machines. But of course, but a lot of their behaviors are are innate, right? They're pre essentially pre wired to perform a lot of these behaviors. And humans, of course, come in. We have a lot of innate uh, structure and abilities, but we we are highly dependent on learning. You know, with the long gestation period and the long childhoods and all that. Do you think that yeah. some of the innate abilities that are still you know some higher cognitive abilities like numerosity and some of the um, symbolic um, capacities that bees have do you think any of that actually gets masked or well i guess i'll just say masked in brains that learn and then i don't, I don't remember what the word you just said but kind of things get kind of messy or covered up or something like that in these yeah kind of uh, obscured by obscured. by other complicated things that are happening yeah i suppose yeah i mean it, i'm not saying uh, bees can do everything i mean they can do certain things like uh, count up to four and uh so probably work uh, in adrian dyer's lab more recently which has shown that bees can even add and subtract in simple ways and they've even uh, developed a concept of zero you can train them to right. to develop a concept of zero right. <laughs> nothingness you know <laughs> yeah uh, and, and so all these things are there i'm not saying they they they, they, they will drive with humans by by any means but and as you're right uh, the evolution has pre-programmed a lot of the neural structure in them and so for example you can train a bee to learn colors and in, 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 i said half an hour right with very few training samples five whereas i think if i'm correct me if i'm wrong but monkeys take a longer time to learn simple tasks like oh my this. god i don't want to talk about that because, yes it yeah, takes yeah, them forever because, because and the, the explanation i've heard is that monkeys are saying wait this cannot be that simple right it's there's got to be something more complicated and so they're trying to figure out the, the really complicated solution or the reason for why they're telling why the experiment is trying to make them do this silly thing. Right? Yeah, you're, ta- you're you're raising my blood pressure right now my through memories here. So, <laughs> yeah, Srini, my I, I mentioned my daughter. Um, I haven't talked about my son yet. Uh, I, my son, I recently had to have a conversation with him because I found out we we have in Durango. I live in Colorado in uh, the United States. And where we live, there's this infestation. Everyone has them in their houses. They're called elm bugs. Um, and they're kind of harmless, but they're just a nuisance. And I found out uh, one day m- my son was um, plucking the legs off of the elm bugs, right, while they're alive. And so we had to have a conversation about how that's not cool, not an okay thing to do to other organisms because they might feel pain and they might be suffering and how that would be a problem. Uh, w- what are your thoughts about? pain you know the perception of pain um in insects and other like quote-unquote lower animals yeah yeah so it's it's, it's it's a very interesting question that you bring up paul and uh, it's a controversial question a difficult one to you know do bees experience pain for example or any other in- insects or invertebrates uh you know if a dog yelps when it gets stung by a wasp or something we are sure it's felt pain sure. right right but if an insect flinches when you prod it with a pin we conclude that this reaction is simply a reflex because hey Right. Invertebrates cannot possibly fail, feel pain, can they? You know, for some reason, we seem to link an animal's ability to sense pain to its uh, perceived intelligence. You know, and I always wonder why? Why do we make this default assumption? Why should the two be linked? I mean, it seems to me that the experience of discomfort caused by a noxious stimulus uh, does not require any particular level of consciousness. I feel. It doesn't require consciousness. So wait. So sorry. Exactly. I think I missed, exactly. Yeah. It doesn't live quite any high level. You, you, something is unpleasant. You. You. I mean, you could again say it's a reflex, right? You could say, okay, mm-hmm. people train uh, flies to avoid the heat to heat chambers and go move away into cool, colder chambers. Is probably not. So they're avoiding the heat, and you could say, 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 okay, that's simply a reflex. But even if it's a reflex, it could. Be, like, there's nothing to say the creature uh, does not feel discomfort, right? <laughs> mm. But doesn't that imply some subjective experience? Discomfort is a subjective conscious. It depends on how you define how you define yeah. discomfort, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have the feeling if I, if I if I know that someone's going to inflict pain on me and I can predict it, I can see that's a conscious tends to be a conscious experience. But you know, if if if, if something happens, I get stung by something uh, without knowing what it is. Uh, I still feel the pain, right? Yeah, uh, and and that's where I think you know. Um, we should be a little more careful. I think our default assumption should be that all creatures feel pain, and then unless proven otherwise, <laughs> is my is my feeling, you know. Yeah. Well, I know. I think that that I don't know. I don't know why when we're young, like my son, like it's not a. You you really have no, 
no empathy for other organisms, essentially. And now I feel bad cutting a branch off of a tree or something. Yeah, it, it, it extends to everything. You're right. I mean, it could be plants are also sentient creatures, they say, and uh, where do you stop, right? I mean, that, that, that's always the problem. I agree completely. And by the way, with with fish, for example, for a long time, uh, you know, uh, oh, there were yeah. no guidelines for working with, uh, you know, um, fish and other cold-blooded vertebrates. And uh, it's only, I think, uh, maybe a decade ago that uh, there was a paper in Nature. And t- typically, it, it was a very, uh, if you think about it, it was a f- fairly simple uh, Almost simple minded, so simple minded. I'm surprised that they got published, published in Nature. But anyway, so they, they took a they, t- they, st- <laughs> they, they took a bee and then made it sting a sting a fish in the oh, tail, God. Okay. And, and then the fish just twitched its tail, and they finally said, "Oh my God, this feels pain," uh, you know. And, and and it was published, and then you know, uh, from then on, it changed. The, it's just a matter of when the world is ready to accept that thing. I think because, of course, the the uh, the fishermen and the anglers were very upset by that. Yes, of course, because they they yeah. always like to believe that there's no pain. Yep. But um, once once you know the world is ready to accept it, I think it gets accepted much more uh, quickly. And in fact, what we were trying to do, uh, we're trying to see whether you know bees feel pain or not, was something. Uh, I thought it was far more sophisticated, and it was it wasn't our own idea. It was borrowed from someone in England who did uh, some work to investigate um, pain in uh, in chickens. And what they did was they they, they jabbed, uh, they wounded one of the legs of the chicken, a bunch of chickens, uh, and then the other control group was uh, you know un, unwounded. Uh, and then they uh, gave uh, both these uh, groups of chickens a choice between two feeders. One was a uh, normal the normal food. And the other one was the same food pellets laced with some uh, painkiller, like ibuprofen, mm-hmm. you know. And then it turned out there was only the wounded chicks. Only they showed a preference for the food that had the painkiller, huh. huh. right? And it wasn't like the, uh, the, the painkiller tasted good and they preferred it that way because the, the unwounded the things did not show a preference that way. They, they were going randomly to both of them, 50-50. So this is more than just a simple uh, reflex reaction to a you know a jab or something. It's really something that says, "Hey, look, I find that this thing makes me feel more comfortable. It relieves my discomfort, right? When I eat this, and I'm going to eat this." So it's a much more subtle way of investigating it, and and you know this is what we tried to do with bees, but unfortunately um, the results were there. A slight difference. The, the we, we used a painkiller which is uh, morphine. We didn't know what to use. What's one thing we tried to use several things, uh, but they showed the the wounded bee showed a slight preference to the morphine, but it wasn't statistically significant enough as to make make a make a claim about it. Mm. So we published a paper saying we really don't know. There's uh, no statistical differences, but here 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 it is, and that's all we can say for the moment. It's possible that we either had the wrong wrong anesthetic. We do really don't know what works well for bees. We still don't know. We had to try several things. So uh, it's still an open question, I feel, you know. Um, yeah, what can I say? Yeah, just more work is needed on this. I think yeah. it's more work is needed. I don't yeah. think it's the, it's just the beginning of a long story, I feel. That, that wasn't a nature paper. You have to ha- have a bee sting a fish to have a, a nature paper. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I, if you think about it, that was so simple-minded. I know I mean, that's great. It's great. <laughs> but, but yeah, like w- when you were talking about fish, I mean, I remember I was I grew up, you know, being taught. Oh, fi- we, you know, I would go out fishing with my grandparents. Well, fish don't feel pain, and my grandfather would clean them alive. You know, would just fillet them alive, and oh, it's fine. They don't feel pain. But on on the other hand, and and we just mentioned, you know, the the chickens and and bees and different examples. On the other hand. There is, like you said, it's a tricky question because the experience that they are experiencing, the sub, the subjective experience there, there are likely different um, gradients of consciousness and uncomfortableness. And I, what is your conception of be consciousness? If you if you had to guess, is there a rich consciousness there, or is there a little flicker of consciousness, or or what? I, th- I don't think it's as rich as humans, but uh, you know, let me give you just one example of some lovely work that. Um chap the name of James Nee uh, did, uh, uh, and he, he found that, um, have you heard of headbutting, um, uh, bees headbutting other uh, bees while they're no. dancing? So uh, what he found was that, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So he found this is about, wow, this is almost about 10 years ago he found this, um, that uh, if a bee uh, notices that another bee is uh, dancing to signal a particular food source that this particular bee has been to and encountered some danger, for example, in the form of a lurking spider that kind of attacked it and wounded it, then this bee, observing bee, will headbutt this dancing bee and stop it from advertising that particular food source. 
and only a bee advertising that particular food source will be head buttered and prevented from dancing. I mean, to say all of this is just a pure instinctive reflex seems uh, really a bit difficult to believe, right? Mm. And also, the, the, the probability of head butting increases with the severity of the injury that this bee has experienced after coming back. Mm. So if it thinks it's really dangerous, it's more likely to do the head butt. So he did some controlled, you know, uh, lovely study where he controlled the sort of uh, pinches uh, of the legs of these bees and released them back home and then looked to see how they behaved in terms of the head butting. And there was a nice relationship between uh, between the two, sort of severity of the injury and the, and the tendency to head butt. I mean, if all this can happen, uh, it's hard to believe all this is just a simple pre-programmed reflex, right? And it's just that particular food source. If it's, if it's signaling that particular distance and direction that signals that particular food source, it says, hey, <laughs> it has the same order as well. It says, hey, don't do that because yeah. uh, you're putting the whole colony in danger. Yeah. Often... I have guests who are using deep learning uh, networks as models of brain activity and brain function. And I know we, we haven't talked about deep learning at all. And, and you, you don't use deep learning in your, in your navigation systems, right? You haven't, have you dabbled no, in that? No, yeah. no, 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 uh, not, not yet anyway. No, no, no. Any no. interest? In, do, do, do deep nets feel pain and are they conscious? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> But you know, if they, if yeah. they, well, if they replicate, that's the thing, isn't it? It's a philosophical question, isn't it? If they replicate all the behavior that uh, you know a, a living creature would uh, would exhibit, if it if it was subject to some noxious stimulus, then I suppose you could say they feel pain. I mean, that's the thing. You see, how can you? Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's hard to decide one way or the other, isn't it? it? Really is. Yeah. But I'm not an expert in deep learning, but I can't help wondering whether you know learning in bees and other simple creatures involves. At least in some, some some processes that might be simpler and faster. It's true that, as you said, a, a lot of what a bee uh, has learned or can learn is partly due to um, uh, evolution, which is sort of fine-tuned and honed these neural circuits. That's kind of a deep learning process that's gone through, uh, you know, several uh, several thousands of years of yeah. evolution. Yeah. Um, uh, but still, you know, as we said, uh, a bee can learn things very quickly, what it needs to learn, and even some things that it doesn't need to learn, novel things, very quickly. It doesn't need millions of training samples, right? I mean, uh, unlike most, uh, you know, uh, deep convolutional uh, networks, uh, it, 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 you know, uh, orders are learned with two or three rewards, uh, colors in half an hour, patterns in half a day. Uh, navigational routes, you know, one or two flights and the bees learned the route, uh, you know, uh, for, its, for its entire life and they can learn new routes very quickly. All this happening very rapidly. Uh, bees, uh, people have shown that bees can recognize human faces. Uh, Adrian Dyer's work, uh, one of my colleagues showed that bees can be trained to distinguish between uh, paintings by Monet and paintings by Picasso. <laughs> Again, probably not part of their <laughs> ecological needs. Yeah, but. that's the thing. You see, it's all novel things. Uh, yeah. And someone, large, large sit has shown that bees can be trained to play golf. This is manipulating a, a, a ball into a hole. And if they get the <laughs> ball to the hole, uh, they get a reward. Uh, all these things are happening and they're learning it very quickly, you see. so. I mean, but the deep, deep learning is, is that's, that's ob one of the obvious... Um, one of the first things people talk about of, of its shortcomings is that it just takes so long to learn. And, and humans as well have one shot and few shot learning. But, but also a lot of what you talked about just in the, um, the optic flow, like, is it basically a simple control system, right? Which is like more of a cybernetics engineering yeah. standard kind of control system. But those aren't necessarily learned, I suppose. Though they're, they're probably uh, they're probably hard, sort of hardwired, I would yeah. say. Yeah, some of the basic control systems, the flight control mechanisms, and so on, are probably uh, hardwired. E even the bee dance, from what I understand, is um, it's only so it, it's, it's the basic ingredients are there. Like basically, like the gait is is programmed into into human infant. It's probably part of the pre-programming thing, just walking, you know, the gait. Uh, but but it's fine tuned uh, mm. after 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 birth. Uh, but the fine tuning happens very, 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 very quickly. I, th I think. I, I, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm totally in awe of the performance of machine learning algorithms, <laughs> and oh, they're this very is always uh, the, important, right? The, 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 everyone has to say this first when they're about to criticize it or say something slightly. <laughs> believe me, it's very impressive. But <laughs> so go, okay, now go ahead. Yep, yep standard. Well, the, the, the yeah. thing is, yeah. What, what the one thing I find a bit unsatisfying about. Uh, the learning machine approach, deep learning, is that while they work beautifully at the tasks that they're supposed to accomplish, we do not, it seems to me, and again, I'm ignorant, I really don't know the subject, so I, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this, uh, you know, with any authority, but we don't seem to have a good idea of, idea of why they work so well. Right. For example, what is the nature of the computation that's being performed? What are the kinds of information that are being extracted by the neurons in the various layers? 
we're still largely in the dark. It's like a black box. Yeah? You feed in millions of examples to a network and you turn a crank and out comes a beautiful result. But the network is still largely a black box. And I find this a little unsatisfying as a scientist because I feel the goal is, the full goal is not achieved. Uh, and I remember that in the, in the late 80s when neural networks first became popular, uh, their study was considered to be, a, be by many to be a, a non-science. What did you think of them? Do you remember what you thought of them back then and, and compared to what you think of them now? I always had this impression about, uh, about uh, you know, it, it, it not, being, uh, not being totally satisfying. I've always had that. Hmm. I think I've come to appreciate it more as a utility, as a tool. You know, hmm. I think, you know, self-driving cars and all this sort of thing, I, it's fantastic. So it's great for uh, engineering applications. It, it's just great. We still don't know how, how it works, and that, that, that's the problem. So uh, in the old days, already in the old days, uh, I remember stories where people were saying, uh, you know, if you're a young faculty member um, applying to work on neural networks, they would say, don't do it because of danger, possibly <laughs> you won't get tenure because you don't consider it to be a science. Right. right? I don't know if you've come across that. Uh, uh, but, but so it's kind of a sledgehammer approach where you blindly turn this crank without really understanding what it's doing. That's what I find is missing. Maybe it'll come, or maybe I, I don't know. Maybe well, it's already been understood and I don't know. No, no. I mean, there is a lot of deep learning theory, but, but there is a lot, in neuroscience, a lot of comparing the activities in some way, whether you're looking at whole population activities or sometimes mm, even mm. individual unit activities with networks in the brain and finding yeah, matches between mm. those. I mean, the, the jury's still out on the, ex the explanatory power of that and like how much that really buys us in terms of understanding. But they're they're not you know they're not black boxes in that sense yeah if if you do find uh, you know units in in the artificial neural network that uh, look very much like uh, show responses they're very similar to what the cortical neurons are doing that's great that 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 that, that, that that's fantastic that that good at least gives us an explanation of why why this circuit is designed that way and, and what it's doing more importantly mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. you said you you called yourself kind of an armchair advisor at this point but do you see within you know, the work that you have done over the years, do you see when people are carrying on that that work and advancing it, are people excited about using the deep learning approach or is it really more of a, a control system? It really approach? is getting very excited. I mean, the, some yeah. of the students I'm trying to help and advise now uh, uh, are, are really getting onto it. It seems to be the uh, yeah the flavor of the month, right? Everyone wants to use it and they want it. And I'm not, not going to try and stop them. I'm just going to say, hey, okay, in the end, does it all make sense to you? Can you please open the black box and see what it's doing? Uh, to me, it's not satisfactory just to say, okay, I've got this uh, network that, uh, you know, that replicates the trajectory of a bee as it flies through a course of obstacles. Uh, I would like to know a little more about how it's doing it and why it's doing it. <laughs> Serena, your best guess, how long is that flavor of the month going to last? Oh, you never know. Uh, you never know. My God. It's, it's kind of had a revival, isn't it? It was there in the 80s for a while, yeah. 80s, early 90s, and then it disappeared. And it came back again with a, with, with a punch, probably because the, the increases in comp computing capacity. So now you can put in, you know, a, a thousand layers and a, a quarter million neurons in each layer and you know, yeah. flick the switch and off it goes. Um, but I'd also, I don't know what the next step is. If, if that goes out of fashion, what is the next step? Uh, I don't know. Is it back to basics? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there's, it's ever forward. So here, well, I'll end on this question. How long until we have a fully, whatever this means, a fully satisfying account of B cognition from neurons to behavior, from the nervous system to behavior? Well, probably, uh, probably uh, when we uh, are able to, I would say, uh, record from each of the individual relevant neurons, you know, and... Uh, I mean, some people are getting to it. Uh, Janelia Farms, as you probably know, uh, you know the Howard here, Hughes mm -hmm. Institute, Janelia Farms, they've uh, sort of uh, got the uh, kind of a blueprint for the, uh, the, the goal is to get the blueprint for the entire the nervous system of the uh, fruit fly, for example. Uh, and fly, I don't yeah. know if they're planning to have a quarter of each one of those. Uh, the one thing about the genetics, molecular genetics, is that it allows you to dissect the system and then and, and, and delete certain uh, parts of the sort of system and uh, see it, get, get an idea of how uh, which circuits do what. But how they do it, again, I think requires electrophysiology, really, to find out how each neuron responds, uh, to find out what, what com competition is doing. And that, uh, that, that, that's where I think molecular biology doesn't... Uh, doesn't help sometimes I feel and there's a lot of interest and funding for molecular biology which is great which is nice as a tool but I find the electrophysiology should also be uh, 
really be funded more, more enthusiastically, I feel. The behavior and the electrophysiology, I think, are really ultimately what's going to uh, tell you what the insect really is doing. For example, electrophysiology might tell you that uh, a neuron could respond to something interesting, but if the animal does not use it right. uh, behaviorally, then the, 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 again, that's that the ultimate test is behavior, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Srini, th- this has been a lot of fun for me. I, I really appreciate the conversation, and uh, you've <laughs> en- enlightened my world about bee cognition, so I appreciate all, all the work in bees that you've done. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Paul. It was very nice, very nice to talk with you. Thank you again. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time.